the real way of understanding most vascular occlusions is it's really serious and really important for the patient, but it's actually a minor injury. Welcome to the Aesthetics Mastery Show. I'm Dr. Tim Pierce. Hi, I'm Ryder Pierce. And today we're talking about one of the most common questions we get on our complications forum, which is what to do if your patient is allergic to hyaluronidase. First of all, then, how can we actually find out whether this patient is allergic in the first place? Well, that's actually one of the most important questions to start with, because diagnosing an allergy to hyaluronidase is very different to just knowing it. So um, if you've had a patient who's had a treatment and they've had a big reaction to it, that is, a, a, you can make that diagnosis with certainty. The next step away from that is some sort of risk factor. So the furthest away is I've got an allergy to bees. So therefore I might be allergic to hyaluronidase. And a lot of people use that as a complete contraindication, which it actually isn't. I think there are about 52 different compounds in bee stings and only one of them is hyaluronidase. So, um, You've got to decide how you how are you saying that they are allergic. You can do an intradermal test, and that will give you some information back. But like any screening test, it's not black and white. So there's everything from a little bit of mild erythema, which might just be part of the normal process of injecting anything into the skin, um, all the way up to a big red raised wheel. And we've got to try and make a decision with everything in between that's also gray. And this is where it gets really complicated is, what if they're just slightly pink or a little bit pink, but they've got a massive VO and it gets really, really hard to be certain about what the right way through is. But it's worth talking about because it's not that rare that people are in this in this predicament. Because hyaluronidase is sort of rel relatively allergic. Actually, I don't think it, it is. It, it's about one in 2,000, the only data I've found for any allergy. Now, that's not anaphylaxis. So one in 2,000 is, is significant, but not, it's not common. You wouldn't say it's common. But as, as is always the case with so many of these things is we're not actually dealing with the real world of what the rates are. We're dealing with reported data, and most of the stuff goes unreported. Now, I, I happen to know through our complications course of one person with a full-blown anaphylaxis and two or three with really significant al allergies. And I don't think any of them are in the data because basically most clinicians, probably 1% of these cases are reported. It's an allergy, you deal with the allergy, you hope your patient's okay and you get on with it. And I do implore everyone to report stuff as much as you can because it all adds to the, the wealth of knowledge that actually enables us to make decisions in reality rather than in just things we're afraid of. Could report it using the yellow card system to the drug companies. Yes, at the very least do that. Um, you may even write a little case report for an aesthetics journal. I think people are more and more interested in this topic. So um, any of those things would be helpful. Let's say that here's a scenario. You have a VO. You, you think you've got a VO in, in your you know, in your hands. What next? There's a, I say that broadly speaking, there's a consensus that it's in a medical emergency, so you can just reverse it. So you don't have to do an intradermal test. Um, those tests are not 100% indicative one way or the other. And you could just start the process of, of reversing it. Now, I think it's reasonable to look for some risk factors. Ask if they're allergic to bees, for example. That might say, and if say you're in the, in the highlands of Scotland, miles from a hospital, and you've only got one EpiPen, you might decide in that sort of circumstance that the information you get, however imperfect from an intradermal test, might might be helpful. Now, I've seen an intradermal test give an enormous reaction. And I've asked myself in that situation, had she had a vascular occlusion with, with a reaction that big, would I really be thinking about putting eight vials of hyaluronidase in to dissolve it? And the answer is no, I wouldn't. And it's this kind of difficult real world situation that we've got to try and think our way through before it happens. Because the other situation is what if they you do your first injection of hyaluronidase and then they react? Are you going to keep injecting hyaluronidase or are you going to stop? Uh, most clinicians will stop if you've got a massive swelling. We've seen one in the clinic, um, very low dose, actually um, came to see us after the procedure, really massive swelling, just huge neck and face swelling, did not turn into full-blown anaphylaxis, but had only had a very tiny amount of hyaluronidase injected. So it's enough to trigger this, this huge response. And it's that scary moment that we're all trying to navigate before we get there. How do you reduce the risk of it? And how do you decide, how do you balance these two risks? Because as with everything, I mean, that's basically what, what healthcare professionals do. We're always balancing risks, benefit versus harm. And as the risk goes up, 
we need to be justifying it with the benefits we're likely to get. And it gets harder and harder to justify that. The, obviously, the more allergic someone is or the more information you have pointing to the fact that they might be allergic. But you would, if you had a VO in front of you, you would do an intradermal test for hyaluronidase, wouldn't you? So let's break this down and think about how you'd make this decision. Um, the first thing you'd need to know is how useful is the test? So it's, it's a screening test, like everything. There are false negatives and false positives. It's possible not to get a reaction in the time that you've got, and it's possible to get a reaction but not to be anaphylactic. Like for, I mean, you might just get erythema just from the fact that you've done an injection, which is also a reason why if you've got any of our protocols, we always talk about a control, because it can give you a little bit more certainty. Now, you what can do you mean get, by control? Uh, you just inject a little bit of saline next to the area, compare it with your injection of hyaluronidase, and that enables you to see how much of this is just from the injection. Uh, and that can, that sometimes helps. But we've still got this problem of it, there isn't really enough data for us to, with certainty, say that if you get, you know, a wheel that's the size of a five pence piece, that that's positive, whereas a 50 pence piece is really, really positive. It's, it's, it's not that black and white. The context in which I do an allergy test uh, is that I'm, I've been doing little intradermal tests for elective reversals for years. I've seen many, many false positives. And what I'd be looking for is a false positive, is a positive that was really clear. And that would be that would be very certain for me not to flood the, the area with 10 vials of hyalase, you know. So if you're um, if I've if you've seen I've probably done I don't know hundreds, and one of them and I'm about to reverse someone for a vascular occlusion and they get a really huge swollen red itchy lump, then I I could not proceed with that in that situation. It would just be very clear to me that there's a risk of triggering a full blown anaphylactic reaction because I'm about to use a heck of a lot more if I un unblock the vessel and then that's really the situation we're talking about, which is. What do you do in that situation when there's a clear allergic reaction plus you have a vascular occlusion? And this this is the discussion where you should think this through before you get in that situation so that you know what your plan is. Because in that situation, chances are your brain will not be functioning normally. Yeah. Because And this is true. When you get very anxious, when you're very stressed out, you actually think less clearly. And especially if it's a situation you haven't thought, thought through before you got there. So um, let's do this now and then people will make a clearer decision in the moment. So I'm in the moment. I've injected some filler. I've checked my capillary refill and it's not there. I've got a query vascular occlusion. I would like to move forward with your protocol, which is to reverse that using hyaluronidase. I do my patch test. The person gets a big reaction. So you can reasonably suggest that they are allergic to that hyaluronidase. What am I now weighing up? That's exactly the question to ask. What are you weighing up in that situation? So this is a little bit dependent on, on context. It's a little bit dependent on how prepared you are. So, you know, we for a while have had an anesthetist in the building with us and an emergency bag with oxygen and vials and vials full of, of, of adrenaline. So you may, that's the kind of thing that might become part of your decision making process. How prepared are you? Uh, you may be doing a, you know, let's be, let's be open about it. Many people do home visits. Many people work in the middle of the sticks, like 30 miles from the nearest hospital. Um, it's different. So what is the context in which you're actually doing this procedure? And the next thing is to actually think about what are, the, what are the worst possible outcomes here? I think what happens in aesthetics is because vascular occlusion is one of the worst things that we can get, we, we literally put it right at the top. It's a 10 out of 10 medical emergency. The truth is if you send your patient to accident emergency with an occlusion in their lip, for example, they will not react like it's a 10 out of 10 medical emergency. That patient will sit in the minors section while they wait for people who are having cardiac arrests to be sorted out first. So that's the, the, the the real way of understanding most vascular occlusions is it's really serious and really important for the patient, but it's actually a minor injury. It's an emergency to treat it because you haven't got time, but let's not put it in the same bracket as anaphylactic shock. So that's the first thing to think about is even if you do nothing, that patient's not going to die. They're going to have a scar. They're going to be upset about it. In fact, many of the time, most times they actually don't scar as much as you think. I've seen so many vascular occlusions recover really, really well, even though they went to the necrotic stage. You could barely see an, out uh, an outcome other than maybe a little bit of skin irregularity. So th that's what you're weighing up. You're weighing up a potential of a, of a small scar in most cases with the potential of triggering anaphylactic reaction with the context that you already know that they're allergic. And for that reason, I would not recommend doing a full reversal procedure when you have evidence that they may be allergic because you just simply can't justify it. If they do have an anaphylactic reaction and die, it's really, really bad. In terms of if you're in the dock kind of thing? Yeah, because I mean, 
who knows if if it's all been documented. So they've had another appointment somewhere else. They've told you they they had a they once swelled quite badly to hyaluronidase, and then you inject them and they have, have an anaphylactic shock, and you and they get very unwell or die. Then there's a clear record that you did something knowing the risk, and it would. My opinion is it would be very hard to justify that risk given that you know that it's a minor injury ultimately. Like the, 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 what you're trying to avoid is a small scar, but you did something that could cause an anaphylactic reaction. I, th I think that, would, that could possibly put you in a serious position as far as your registration is concerned. So does everyone follow this principle or are some people taking a different route? So I have now come across... Uh, four or five different cases where a clinician has decided that the best thing to do for the patient is to suppress their immune system with steroids and antihistamines, and often they get colleagues to come and support them, um, They and then they do a, a reversal in that circumstance. So um, When they're allergic. So these are, yeah, these are patients where you know there's an allergy, and you're essentially trying to mitigate the risk of anaphylaxis through immunosuppression for a short period of time. And in all of those cases, a a safe result emerged and the patient got what they wanted and there wasn't an anaphylactic reaction. But I'm absolutely not recommending this as a as a route forward because we have literally no data on what percentage of people are are, are, are controlled in this circumstance and how safe it is to do that in an out-of-hospital setting because all of these are out of hospital. But it's worth knowing that, that people are doing that kind of thing. Um, they are very scared to talk about it because they're open to criticism. But um, I can I can let it out there anonymously, and and they are, none of them are alone. Um, I think it's happening probably more than we think. So it'd be interesting to know what your thoughts on that, particularly everyone watching. I'd love to know if anyone has any opinion on that, one way or the other. If you think it's the most insane idea you've ever heard, then please put in the comments exactly why. And I'd love to hear this from anyone who's in a specialty involved with either hyaluronidase or immunology, um, aller allergy, and all those kind of things. It would be great to hear from someone whose special interest is this topic. So, um, but yeah, it's it's not something I'm recommending. It's high risk but it's out there, people are doing it. So please guys, let us know what you think about the situation. It's probably one of the most nuanced and difficult situations in medical aesthetics, and we'd love to hear what you think about it in the comments down below. Also, if you'd like to see a visual breakdown of an elective and a, an emergency reversal protocol, then click on the link below and you can download two, two for free from my website. Thanks very much for watching and we'll see you next week. Thanks for watching, bye.